already with Master Supreme Real Estate Group. Good. So you really have a strong opinion about this whole thing. I mean, being that you're a district resident, you've worked in the district, and now you're involved in something that actually has direct connection to a concern about urban planning and design, etc. So, is this your first meeting doing this? This is my first meeting about the Hyde Act, yes. And were you surprised to hear that there was some talk about whether or not that we should perhaps re-examine the way no, in which we do things? No, I, uh, I'm familiar with the Hyde Act. I studied it uh, back in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and uh, I was familiar from the newspaper that Congressman Issa had opened the question, so mm -hmm. this meeting did not surprise me. Now, do you really, th really think that there might be some changes in the next 10 years that would be significant if, in fact, we agree that we may want to approach development a little differently? Change is always possible, mm -hmm. and one never knows exactly when or how it will take place, but it's good mm -hmm. to be prepared. What would you like to see? If you have a, you know, your own opinion right now, are you leaning towards the idea that we should engage in more, say, transit-oriented development, which would be taller buildings around the metro, perhaps in the perimeter? I think, I think that regardless of what we do with the Hyde Act, mm -hmm. whether it stays the same or not, right now there's no necessary or there's a weak connection between what zoning and planning and the Hyde Act allow. Mm -hmm. and what private individual landowners actually do. Mm -hmm. So even under the current regime, uh, zoning may encourage higher buildings near metro. Mm -hmm. And a landowner may leave it as a parking lot or a boarded up building or a vacant lot. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can do to create a better connection between what the city wants in the way of height and density and what landowners do in response. And if we create a better connection in that regard, we could increase the supply of both office space and residential space and make the city more affordable and more sustainable. Well, someone brought up this point at the last meeting is that she felt that there wasn't enough, um, that, that there, there were many spaces that were available that weren't being filled. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do have vacant lots and boarded up buildings in the city. So even though one can make a case, and I think it's a compelling case, that the current height limitation has forced development outside of the city and has artificially raised land prices, and I think that's true. Nonetheless, it's also true that some landowners have allowed their land to remain fallow and haven't utilized it to its full potential. And that's a detriment to everybody in the city. So there's more to it than just about building taller. It's about usage of what we currently have right. in the rules that garden and, and, and it also that. is important to understand to what and, and I think the height limit raises an interesting question, which is what part of a property's value belongs to individual landowners and what part belongs to the public? So for example, if we have a, a piece of land that's zoned for 10-story buildings, mm -hmm. and assuming that there's a demand, let's say, to fill space up to 50 stories, mm -hmm. if we were to change the zoning on that 10-story land from 10 stories to 20, we'd have doubled the value of that land. Now, did the landowner do anything special to deserve that increase in value? Where did that value come from? The public created that value. Mm -hmm. And that increase in value should go back to the public and not be a windfall to the private landowner. Okay, so air rights could be sold and provide a revenue stream That's right. for the district in, right. in its own benefit. On the other hand, if a landowner puts up a building, an office building or an apartment building to house people or jobs, mm -hmm. that value is created by the landowner. Mm -hmm. And it's a mistake for the city to try to tax that value because by doing that, we make that building more expensive. In other words, if he doesn't, the property tax that we now charge on buildings is equivalent to a 10 to 20 percent sales tax on building, construction, labor, and materials. Mm -hmm. If I proposed that at the city council, they'd say, Rick, that's a terrible idea. That would make buildings too expensive. Mm -hmm. But without realizing that we do that with the property tax. Mm -hmm. So by asking this question, you know, what part of the property value belongs to the landowner and what part belongs to the public, if we answer that in the right way, we can come up with a better approach 
that allows us, regardless of what the height limit is, to make better use of our existing land and make sure that the private people get to profit from their efforts to build and maintain buildings and that the public profits from it, its efforts to improve land values, either through zoning, through height limits, or, as you mentioned earlier, by providing transit. Mm -hmm. If we put a, a metro stop next to a piece of property, the land value there goes way up. Mm -hmm. Not because of what the private landowner did, but because of what the public did Access to create mm -hmm. yeah. transit there. Meanwhile, Metro's going broke because we are allowing the private landowner to profit off of the value that Metro creates. If Metro created could, could recapture the value that it has created, we wouldn't be having Metro in its financial difficulties. Okay, Metro no. cost about $10 billion to build. Mm -hmm. It has created more than $10 billion in land values around the state. Well, you brought up a good point because maybe some people don't necessarily realize that Metro is having these financial difficulties oh, right do. now. Oh. Well, they noted that you know they, the, they, the, the rates are raising what, in occasion. What they don't understand mm -hmm. is the connection between Metro's financial difficulties and the price of land around the station. They don't always make that connection. Do you think that's the primary expense that's making it prohibitive to for Metro to grow in, in a way that it could be? Well, financially or what, what's the pro the thing is that Metro becomes valuable if lots of people use it, right? Mm -hmm. If nobody wrote the system, it wouldn't be valuable to have a station. If you make the fares too expensive, people don't use the system. Mm -hmm. So in order for people to use the system for the system to be valuable, you need to keep fares low. Mm -hmm. When you keep fares low, people say, oh, well, that's just, you're just giving money away to the riders. Mm -hmm. Well, if you really think about it, the people who really profit from the low fares are people who own land next to the station. Mm -hmm. If tomorrow I made metro ridership free, what would happen is land value next to the metro station would skyrocket. Yeah, because the demand would be, would be so much greater. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what most people fail to realize. The connection between public works, transportation, sewer, water, police, fire, schools, and private land value. Mm -hmm. If the public can recapture the value that the public creates, recycle it for public use, public infrastructure like schools and transit can be financially self-sustaining. And at the same time, by reducing the tax on privately created value like buildings, we can make housing and office space more affordable. If we do these things together, we can make DC a more affordable and sustainable city. Do we need to raise the building heights, though, in order that's to achieve that? That's a separate question. But they are somehow connected because of the uh, density connected. and all those things They're are connected. Factored. And the, this discussion about what we do with building heights mm -hmm. raises the question about the link mm -hmm. between the regulatory permission to build mm -hmm. and the private decisions and profit from building. Mm -hmm. And it's that question that leads to that situation that we've ignored up to this point. So that should be a factor in making the ultimate decision as to whether or not we need to tamper with the Hyde Act, in your opinion. Right, it's a factor. So that if we do decide to change the Hyde Act and the height limits, any resulting change in property value as a result of this public action mm -hmm. should accrue to the public mm -hmm. and not simply be a windfall to the private. But side. then that has to be enforced well, and there's always that problem. Well actually that's easy because mm -hmm. we know what the value of property is in the city. We, we see private transactions and we assess uh, property values at market value. It's very hard to hide the value of a piece of land. So, and it's also very hard to move a piece of land, say, from D.C. to West Virginia, or some low tax jurisdiction. So if you actually tax publicly created land value, it's a very easy thing to enforce because it's very public, it's very observable, and it's very measurable. So you have faith that in the end, the revenues derived from that uh, from the sale, sale of the land or sale of the air rights would actually end up in the areas in supporting the areas that would we would want to support. Well, it. that's a political issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, or administratively all, political. Well, right? I mean, it, it, it hits at, at various levels. First mm -hmm. of all, we have to decide philosophically, we haven't done this yet, that we want publicly created values to come back to the public and privately created values to stay with the mm -hmm. private sector. Mm -hmm. So we have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. Once we make that decision, then it's a separate question. Well, now that the public sector is benefiting more from its investment in schools and transit, does the public sector use that money wisely? Well, that's up to the city council mm -hmm. and to the various city departments 
to be wise in the way that they spend and administer public funds. So it's a, it's not an easy question, but this, we're we're starting on the road to, to a asking the right questions that hopefully will lead to better answers. So finally, as an ex uh, district employee, do you have faith that if we do implement a new strategy about how we handle valuable land around our metro, which in, would may potentially involve changing the Hyde Act or amending it somehow that would actually benefit, the public would benefit, as opposed to private developers. I think if we handle this discussion correctly, mm -hmm. there's certainly a potential that we could become a more economically vital and sustainable city. But uh, the, we, have to, we have to ask the right questions and then we have to come to the right conclusions. So it's, uh, it's not a done deal either way. But I think the potential is there for the city to move in a better way.